Welcome back to the Governor's House. I'm Larry Sharp. Talking to you about what you want to hear about today. Just talking more about sexual harassment right now. I told a quick story about when I was in the Marine Corps and also when I was teaching at uh, a college, two issues that we've had. One thing I want to bring up here is when I was in the Marine Corps and I actually had to take some time to be a platoon sergeant in a place where there were women and men in the same platoon. The problem that I had was, believe it or not, wasn't with the women. It was the men. Particularly in the 80s, 30 years ago when integration was tough, there were some growing pains. I had a problem where I couldn't get the men to do their job because they were all chasing after the women. So you'd have one woman, two women, and 20, 30 male Marines, and they were all chasing after the women during the day. So if I get your work done, they wouldn't do their work. They'd be trying to impress the woman. Now, the thing that was great is some of them wanted to be all tough guys. So that was kind of good. They got to get some extra work out of some of them. But if it wasn't physical work, it actually made things tougher. It was harder. There was, there was actually, um, there were growing pains in making that work. There were growing pains in making that integration connect. Now, I'm saying that because as we move into, I guess, almost another era, uh, era of dealing with women in a workforce and the sexual harassment issues, there are going to be growing pains. It's going to be difficult. At what point do we say someone is right, someone is wrong? No matter what, I want to make sure we're doing one thing, and that is we are 100% supporting the victim, but at the same time, we are also supporting the accused. Both. Again, the goal has to be not to punish. Punishment may not be the goal. Punishment may be the end game. That may be a means to an end to stop something, but it shouldn't be the end game. The end game is stopping the harassment. And if we see that you can stop the harassment without necessarily using zero tolerance and throwing some out of the organization, then you'll actually find people report harassment more. And they'll report it earlier. And they'll actually begin to understand what it actually is. And people won't report it because it's, I don't like that some guy asked me out. Now to be clear, just to be clear, when it comes to harassment versus something else, right? When it comes to harassment versus anything else, there's a difference. Inappropriate behavior is inappropriate, but it isn't harassment necessarily. If I walk up to some woman who I work with, who is my peer, and I say, hey, sweetheart, let's go out or something like that, she may not like that, but that's not harassment. If she tells me no, and I ask her again, that's harassment. Or if I'm her boss in some way, shape, or form, that's harassment. But assuming I'm just some coworker and I ask someone out, that doesn't make it harassment. It may, maybe you don't like it, and I should stop, and the goal should be to stop. This is so bad in certain companies, you probably know this now if you're, if you're watching, Certain companies, they actually ask you to sign documents stating that you're dating someone within the organization because they're so afraid of this. Zero tolerance policies, which are all over, are based on the idea that people are going to be bad. We can't stop it, so punish. Punishment is righteous. Punishment makes me feel good. Here's the sad part. Punishment's not helpful. Righteousness is not helpful. Changing your culture to where people don't want to do this is helpful. Focusing on people not wanting to do this is helpful. That's what we have to focus on. But that goes past sexual harassment. That goes past any, that goes from any harassment, but it goes even further into, it goes even further into not just sexual harassment, but also into race relationships. It goes into gender relationships. It goes into anything. I want you to realize the goal should never be punishment. And often if you punish people, they may actually do it more because now their thought process is actually reinforced. It's actually reinforced and they will do it again after being punished. Sometimes you need two and three, two and three strikes for someone to actually be out. It, it does get crazy sometimes. All right, why do I bring this up? I'm bringing this up more than anything else because I don't want us to do that knee-jerk reaction. The knee-jerk reaction that makes us feel like we should be doing, uh, let's make sure we use prohibition because prohibition feels good, but prohibition never works. Culture change takes time. We don't want the quick answer, but a long answer. All right, um, I'm gonna take a phone call. I have uh, Evan on line one. Evan, how are you? I'm good. What's going on, Evan? Yeah. What are you talking about today? Go ahead, please. 
of advocating for the abolition of the federal government under a new, much more limited federation, something akin to the original Articles of Confederation, perhaps simply just called America. So are you, you're asking if I like the idea or that I would push for this idea? Which one? Uh, I guess it's just your thoughts on it and uh, on, you know, if you think well, look, viable, this, it's is it viable? Yeah. Absolutely not. There's, it's, it's, it is, let's be clear, it is not viable at all. In today's, in today's America, that is not viable. In 20 years, 40 years, 50 years from now, perhaps it's viable. It's possible, but it isn't viable now. Would I like for us to get closer and closer to a world like that? Without question, yes. Of course, I'd like us to get closer to that. Absolutely. And I would try my best to push us towards something like that with more and more and more, um, with more freedom, with more freedom. So, I'm sorry, they can't hear the caller on Facebook, huh? Okay, the caller asked. The caller asked, would I, be, uh, would I be okay moving towards or pushing towards an Articles Confederation government? Is that what I, would I be okay with that? Is it viable? And my answer was, it's not viable in today's world. Not, maybe, maybe 1% of the American population would believe that. Maybe. And I'm, I'm being generous when I say that. So it's not viable now. But would I want to move us towards something like that? Of course I would. I would want us to move towards that if we could. Look, the more we can be free, the more we can be local, the better we're going to be, right? We want to have a world of innovation. We want to have a world of, a world of incubators. We want people, in my business, when I talk to business owners about how to make their companies better, how to make their leaders better, how to grow their companies and be innovative, never do I say, you know what, Iron Fist, that's the answer, more centralized control. That's going to help. Never do I say that. What I always say is, let your leaders be leaders. Give them more freedom. Give them more power. Give them more authority. And some of them will fail. Absolutely. Leaders will fail. But here's the good part. Some of them are going to excel. And the next piece that's also about that is, a lot of people in highly regulated, centralized environments, they hide in that. They hide behind policy. They hide behind what's happening. They hide behind mediocrity, which is acceptable. But when you allow them to grow, what winds up happening is, those who are really bad begin to fail often, one, two, three times. Now you know to get rid of them. They can't hide anymore. And those who are amazing can now fly to the top. And you can actually increase your leadership, make it actually better if you decentralize. Evan, did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. Basically, how to allow the greatest amount of decentralization while still giving a plausible attachment to like a national experiment that's simply not going to go away if it's the attachment to the idea of America. I think you're right. We want to be as decentralized as we can by accepting that the nationalism that is America is not going to go away. It's still here. It's, and it's going to be here for a long time. And I'm okay with it. I mean, I'm still okay with it. I'm still, you know, I still got the, the pin. <laughs> I'm still okay with it. I'm Marine. I'm still okay with it. But do I want decentralization? Absolutely, yes. Thank you so much for your call, Evan. I appreciate it. All right, so if someone else wants to uh, call in, please feel free, 877-480-4120. If you want to talk on the Facebook stream, please feel free. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy. Gary Gutierrez says, you're the man you make me want to live in New York so I can vote for you. Thank you. That's awesome. I want more people to vote for me. For those of you who want to support me, LarrySharp.com. That's Larry Sharp with an E. E makes it special. Dot com. I'm going to talk about the decentralization, decentralization idea specifically here in New York. Right now, we have a Board of Regents, which basically controls all of our education in New York. And it controls almost everything. And it basically has no boss. And it's a bunch of people get, who get appointed and decide they know what's best. Now, I actually don't mind a board like that existing. I am okay with that. Some people want to just get rid of everything. I'm all right with that. The key issue here is it should have no teeth. It should have no power. If it wants to be an advisory board, if it wants to be a board where people can go and, and talk things out, if it wants to be a repository for information or ideas, any of those things I'm okay with. Would I prefer everything to go away? I think it's too much to ask. To Evan's point, the, the state surely isn't there. I don't think the country is there either. And I want to turn this ship around and move it towards more innovation and choice. The Board of Regents should have no teeth. It should simply be an organization that people can go to to find information, find answers, support, whatever the case may be. 
But the second it says, you must do it or else funding goes away. You must do it or else you can't have teachers. You must do it or else we will fine you. Now we have a problem. But it's not just the Board of Regents, that's for education. There's also when it comes, believe it or not, for you to get addiction treatment in New York State. There's an organization called OASIS. And OASIS decides, hey, we're gonna tell you how you can be treated for addiction. We know what's best. Well, clearly they don't, we have an epidemic. So whatever they know, it's not working. So you might say, but Larry, if there's no OASIS, then people you know, will be fraught with fraudulent ways of treating addiction. That's happening now, clearly. That's happening right now. Why wouldn't I want to give people the opportunity to find treatment the way they think they should? I was just last night recently on a podcast for uh, vaping, uh, Vaping Legion. And they mentioned that for some people, vaping becomes a way of breaking addictions. Not just nicotine, but other addictions, right? Even the heroin or whatever the case may be, there are other people who use vaping as a way to stop that addiction. Now, is that the answer? I doubt it. Is it an answer? Yes. And why wouldn't I allow all of those answers to be there? Why wouldn't I allow an incubator in every city, in every town, all over the place? How about people who don't believe in Eastern medicine? People don't believe in alternative medicine. So now Oasis is gonna say, that doesn't work? Well, maybe for you it does. Is it the answer? I don't know, is it an answer? Absolutely yes. So the goal here in New York State is not to keep it all together and have all the answers. The best leaders can't. The best leaders know that they cannot have all the answers. And executives shouldn't think, oh, I'm gonna become governor, I'm gonna become president or mayor because I'm the smartest guy in the room and I have all the answers. Here's what I'm sure of, you don't. That I know. You may have some of the answers and I hope you do. You don't have them all. I know that for sure. So why in the world would I try to get you to have more answers? Because once we set that up as the norm, the executive must have all the answers. We're doomed to fail. We're doomed to fail. She's never gonna, she's never gonna have all the answers. But not just that, how about all the people who wanna support that leader who actually do have answers? Real good answers. But something else, uh, never forget this. Aaron Comey, who ran for mayor here in New York, he told me something, he said, Larry, um, what could I give everyone that will make everybody happy right now? The answer is nothing, because there's no way. Everyone needs happiness in their own way. Everyone needs happiness in their own way, but I'll go one step further. What could I give you to make you happy now and 10 years from now? Nothing, because your needs and wants and desires will change in 10 years. You will always decide that you don't want this anymore. You'll want something else. Decentralization is the answer. It's the answer in government. It's the answer in business. It's the answer in your life. Whatever the case may be, that is the answer. Do you believe me? Not? Tell me, 877. 480-4120, like to the Facebook page, Larry Sharp for New York, and chat. We'll be right back. You might want to try angling yourself just a little bit that way so you miss the lamp. Just, just to, no, 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 the other way, yeah, that way. Perfect, perfect. <clears throat> But yeah, you're getting a lot of play on Facebook. Beautiful. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah. You had someone from Iran listening to you. In Germany, in Japan. I have someone from Iran listening to us. Oh my God. <laughs> Let's hope they're not targeting this spot with their nuclear missiles. Right. We'll see. They're going to try to get me. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone would be happy with a free phone. Wow. Say again? <laughs> Someone posted. Everyone would be happy with a free pony. That uh, that is actually the uh, that's actually um, Berman Supreme's idea. Oh. He wants free ponies for everybody. You've got thirty shares. That's really good. For those of you on the uh, live feed, we're in a commercial now. Um, if you're plugged in, they probably aren't, aren't hearing you. Yeah. 
All right, welcome back to the governor's house. Um, happy that you're here. If you want to talk to me, call in 877-480-4120. We're talking about whatever you want to talk about, but I talked about uh, sexual harassment. I also talked about the idea, I also talked about the idea of um, you know, decentralization. I think it's an important piece, both in New York State and throughout the entire nation. But there's something else here, and I want to go back to what I talked about, the idea of happiness. People often ask me, they say, Larry, what's the Libertarian Party about? And in case some of you don't know, I'm a Libertarian. So they ask what it's about. And people say, well, it's about people dying in the streets and being shot up and fighting for gas with machine guns, like Road Warrior and the zombie apocalypse. Of course not. That is people who are upset and who don't know. And who don't know. The reality, what the party's actually about, and we get confused as Libertarians, it's actually about the pursuit of happiness. It's about choice and innovation and you being able to do what you want to do, when you want to do it, as long as you don't hurt anybody else. That's what it's actually about. And the problem is we talk about freedom and liberty. That's not what it's about. That's, that's the means to the end. The end is actually freedom and happiness. That's the end. How do you get there? Through, you, how do you get to happiness? Through freedom. The ability for you to chase happiness the way you want to chase it, even if you fail. Chase happiness the way you want to chase it, even if you're wrong, but you learn from that. You become stronger from that. You're happier on the journey. And that may sound new age, yes, I know, but it's still true. It doesn't really matter. It's still true. So you want to do that. So that's what this movement's actually about. And if you get that, then you can start talking. Then you can say, well, what about school choice? Or what about uh, regulation? Or what about this? And what about that? And it all comes back to that concept. But more importantly, what will make you happy today may not make you happy tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. You may not even know. And that's okay, as long as you try. So Kyle says, Larry, if you don't mind me asking, if you haven't already answered, um, what's Bridget in the Libertarian Party? Hold on, see if I get this. Um, movement aside from the ideas and to break the cycle of the two parties. Well, because I always was Libertarian. If you notice, every time I talk about Libertarianism, I often bring back things in my business. I bring it up all the time. I've been teaching the idea of post-industrial leadership for years. What does that mean? Post-industrial leadership. Prior to our kind of world now, we were heavily in industrialized society, which means people went to factories and did stuff and went home. And that was awesome, that's what it was. And school was great for that too. School teaches you to sit in a room, do what you're told, don't move around, follow orders, and do that for 12 years, you'll be fine. And if we're, if we're marching ourselves off to a factory, well done, good job. We don't do that anymore. We're not marching ourselves off to factories anymore. In fact, as a leader in the, in the business world, I don't need your arms and legs very much at all. I buy them overseas or a machine does it for me. I need your brain. I need your innovation. I need your inspiration. I need your ideas. I need your initiative. That's what I need. And to get that, I can only get that if you buy in. I can only get that if you agree with me. I can only get that if you get it with me that you have decided you're part of my team. That is freedom. That is how you get power. That is how people become powerful. That is how organizations become powerful. That's how groups become powerful. This is called volunteer socialism. Drives people crazy when I say that. But it's true. It's okay. And humans will naturally do this, right? You, if there was no rules, regulations, all of a sudden tomorrow at all, zero, we would create our own civic groups, our own church groups, our own uh, uh, um, hobby groups. We create them. We become social voluntarily. People ask me all the time, Larry, is there an example of libertarianism at work? Yeah, it's called the Amish. The Amish are exactly libertarian. They're a voluntary organization. They all get together on their own to decide we want to be together and follow these rules. They don't need insurance because when someone's house burns down, they all fix the house, whatever the case may be. Someone's sick, they take care of them. They've chosen this. It's voluntary. In fact, they have the rule. I forgot where it is. Someone I'm sure will know. When you're a teenager, you have to go away for a year or something and see if you like the outside world. You smoke dope, I guess, have sex. I guess is what you do. And then decide if you want to keep it. If you like it, you stay out. If you don't, you come back. It is voluntary. You decide to go back. That's what voluntary society is. That's what anarchy actually is. It is people voluntarily deciding what they want to do. Now, here's the funny part. In a libertarian society, the Amish can exist. But how about a fascist society? No. How about a communist society? No. If you go to the fringes of the Democrat Republican Party, the fringes, if you go to the fringes, 
they are authoritative. They are authoritative. The fringe of the Democratic Party is communism. The fringe of the Republican Party is fascism. That's the fringe. If you go to their fringes, you get a bunch of people trying to control you. You get camps. You get terrible things when you go to their fringes. When you go to our fringes, you get people who live in the woods and buy Bitcoin. That's our fringes. I'm okay with that. I like our fringe. Our fringe is good. So I don't distance ourselves from the fringe. It's totally fine. I don't mind. So if you ask what being a libertarian is about, it's about that. And how did I get involved? I already was one. I didn't know it until I heard, believe it or not, Gary Johnson speak in 2012. When Gary Johnson spoke in 2012, that's when I realized, oh, wait a minute. This kind of makes some sense. And then I started to literally follow the party. And I realized, oh, I was already here. I was here already. I didn't know it. Someone finally put a name to what I believed in. I think the first libertarian book I read wasn't actually libertarian. It was a book I read about business, and it's a book by Robert Ringer. Robert Ringer is a big Ann Rander, and he's libertarian. And I read his books, and his books were amazing. They helped me to grow my business. They helped me to teach people. They helped me to be a better teacher, instructor, consultant. So he already was kind of put me in that world. The first libertarian book I read was probably Bastiat's The Law, and I enjoyed that tremendously. It made me see a lot of parallels in today from France in the 1850s. So I think that's kind of how that happened for me. I hope I answered your question well enough. I know I, I tend to bounce around sometimes. So, all right. Um, uh, someone asked now, how do you plan on being able to successfully implement libertarian policy in a state with, with centuries of special interests to make it easier for you? Call me Mac. Thank you, Mac. Makoto Ozawa. Don't worry about it. I live in Japan for four years. I know your name. No worries. So, so yes. Um, Makoto, it's okay. So, yeah, it's a great question. People ask me all the time, Mario, what do you mean your first 100 days? Are you going to make magic happen? No. I'm going to be universally hated when I win. The assembly is going to be against me. The press will be against me. The state senate will be against me. Everyone will be against me. So there's no way I'm going to walk in and make magic happen right away. But here's what I can do and what I will do. I will use actual executive power to create two offices. One, the office of the repeal. The office of the repeal is going to be an office where people will look and see what regulations and rules are useless. Things like licenses to braid hair. Licenses to walk dogs. These actually exist in New York State. Licensing to have a vape shop when there's nothing behind the license but an application. Getting rid of all those licenses. Not getting rid because I can't. That'd be against the law. But I'm deciding that maybe I shouldn't enforce those right now. I have other things that are more priority for me. And I won't enforce those for a year or so. While I don't enforce those for a year, guess what will happen? Nothing. There will not be a string of dog walking murderers or hair braiding accidents where millions of people die or vape shops that explode and people die. That is not going to happen. Why? Because it never happens. That's not going to happen. And when that doesn't happen, that will actually give cover to the state assemblies and to the state senate so that they can actually decide to repeal some of these things. So it'll be year two when most of the repeals actually happen. Now, once I begin to do this and not enforce it, I will be attacked by everyone. The press will say I'm evil and I hate dogs or I hate kids or I hate whatever. Of course they're going to say that. But it doesn't matter because I'm going to be attacked every day anyway. And I will eventually become immune, just like Trump is right now. It's the, the, every TV show was I hate Trump show. So he doesn't care anymore. I'll be the same thing. So it's fine. They'll hate me, whatever the case may be. But you know who will love me? Dog walkers and people who bring hair and people who own vaping shops. They will love me. That will be awesome. And when they love me, they're going to tell people, look, I'm glad this guy's in power. He's, he's leaving us alone so we can make money, so we can actually be successful. Why in the world would I want to stop people from making money in their own communities, from looking value in their communities, from hiring people in their own communities? And that's what dog walkers and hair braiders and vape shops are. They are literally community-based small businesses. That's what they are. And they're being stifled by the government, and we should stop that. I will. Now... Does the state assembly or the state senate actually care? Not at all. Don't care at all. It makes them feel good to pass laws protecting you. See, I care about you. Got it. No worries. I will give them cover and I will take the slings and arrows so they can go, oh, wait a minute. I really should repeal this law. That's when repeals come in. And I'll be doing a lot of that. Laws, rules, regulations like that. Second thing, the office of the pardon. I will not wait six months, 20 years, whatever the case may be, before I pardon people. I'll start pardoning people right away. Who will I pardon? I will pardon non-violent drug offenders. I'll begin to do that right away. Mar people who had marijuana in their pocket. And I'm not going to simply commute their sentence or let them out of jail. They will be pardoned because they shouldn't have been convicted in the first place. Their convictions will be expunged so they can actually go out and start their life. They can go back to their families, go back to their communities, and, and be successful again. Guess what they know how to do? 
run a business. That's why they got caught, running a business, which is illegal. So they can go actually run a business then and actually do something in a community. Their families can have them back. That's what I want to do. Now you might say, Larry, that's a gamble. Why does no one do it? Because here's what I know. If I let 100 people out and pardon them, two will do something stupid, guaranteed. They will go act, they will, you know, uh, attack somebody, rob a store, somebody. of course they will. And when they do, the press is going to say, see, Larry, this is your fault. Look at what you did. And what I will tell them is two people did something wrong when 98 didn't. This country was built on the idea that it's okay for a guilty person to go free as long as an innocent person is not imprisoned. So two people got away, but 98 were saved. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that every day of the week. And I will then show people that these drug laws are silly. These drug laws are silly. That is what I will show them. I will give the assembly, I will give them cover so they can stop. I will use the bully pulpit for the entire year so they will hear this again and again and again, and we can make that stop. All right, I have a phone call. And I will repeat the question for those of you online. Uh, this is Ramon on line one. Ramon, how are you? Hey, Larry, I've been following you for a while. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Does that mean you're happy or you hate me? Which one? Uh, I, I think. Wow, well, you're not sure. Good. That's not good. <laughs> Pretty, good. Pretty good, man. Good. What's what's going on? What's uh, your question? Well, I'm not I'm not a resident of your state, but I told my cousin to vote for you because. Thank you. I'm honestly I'm I'm an independent, and I think it's better to have alternatives, especially in a state like yours when there's two parties that are apparently very dysfunctional. I think the two parties are dysfunctional, you're correct. And I'm okay with you being independent, just vote libertarian. But go ahead. So, I do have some issues with the LP, but I, I guess I'd like to ask your analysis. Do you think now with this tax bill that it will create more uh, upward pressure from New York State residents or Albany to repeal a lot of these, uh, you know, some of these extortionist taxes that I hear about from my cousin. Yes, let me cover a couple things, Ramon. Let me give you a couple things. The first thing is, thank you for calling in. And even though you can't vote, you can still donate, LarrySharp.com. So don't forget to support me because it's important. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Uh, on top of that, I think, yes, the, the tax bill does make people in New York talk about tax more. We often don't. And the reason is, we're broken. We've been hit so much with such heavy taxes for so long. It's a thing called learned helplessness. It's an actual thing. We are actually, we've been taught that we cannot win. There is no chance. We become hopeless. So many New Yorkers don't talk about that horrible tax rate that we actually have because we think there's no way around it. I hope that this will make people talk about it more. But here's the most important piece. It will allow me to talk about it more because what they will talk about is tax breaks or tax cuts. I will talk about abolishing the entire state income tax completely. But first, most important thing, reducing spending. I am not actually a fan of tax cuts. It sounds crazy, but I'm not. I'm a fan of reducing spending. If we just cut taxes, someone else pays for it, or we increase our debt. I want to reduce spending, and here's the hard part, without reducing service. How do we do that? I will tell you that when we come back. 877-480-4120. We'll head to the Facebook page and uh, chat, and I'll answer your questions. We'll be right back. All right, good job. I'm getting a lot of love on Facebook. Glad I'm answering your questions, guys. Thank you for that. They're not hearing you because you're, they're hearing this. They're not hearing you. Is she still on the line or is he off? He just dropped. Okay. Oh, we can hear you on Facebook. 
Live feed can still hear. All right. Second. They the, they can still hear you. So. Oh, good. One hundred twenty-seven shares. You're rocking it. So we're back at the governor's house. I'm Larry Sharp talking about what you want to talk about. I'm being pretty easy tonight. I want to give a shout out to Maria Edinburgh. Thank you so much, Maria, for supporting me. I really appreciate it. There are two things I want to cover right now. One of them is the idea of how can we reduce spending with that without stopping services. And the example you will hear me give all the time is we have to create more options, more choices for the current government monopolies who do these things. Monopoly is bad, period. If it was a big company, you'd hate it. Government's just a big, bigger company that's even less efficient. So, and it takes your money. So it's even worse, whether you like it or not, right? At least a company only takes your money if you pay them, right? Government just takes it anyway. So I want to break monopoly. So what does that mean? What we want to do is something like this. The post office. The post office has UPS and the post office has FedEx. If for some reason the post office had to go out of business tomorrow, the world wouldn't end. The world wouldn't end. What would happen? FedEx and UPS could pick up the slack. That would be awesome. I love that. Or someone would buy the post office. Either one, no worries. Not just that the post office has become a better organization. It still loses money, not as much though, and it actually does certain things well. For example, it's a very good bulk shipper, better than the others, right? Better than UPS and FedEx, and it goes to places FedEx won't go. So you want to send a package to Barrow, Alaska, FedEx isn't going there. So FedEx pays the post office, and the post office goes there. Now FedEx is a customer of the post office. So everything we do, I want to begin to create options. Options for an MTA, options for welfare services, options for support structure, options and choices, facilitate these options and choices. Once they pop up, now we can begin to reduce spending. When we reduce spending, we can either pay off the debt and or reduce taxes. The goal is not a short-term answer. The problem with reducing taxes is all it is is a short-term fix that puts us more into debt. It doesn't actually fix the problem. The problem is we are still too relying, too too much relying on government, the, the one monopoly, the inefficient monopoly that it is, to do what we want. We want services from people who actually want to serve you. And now people say, but Larry, how about people who are in trouble? Even people who are in trouble. How many times have you gone to a government organization that's supposed to help you, and they go, well, I can't really help you. I can't, the rules, I can't, the rules. Charities go, I'll come to your house. I'll help you. Only thing that slows the charity down is, is, is government regulation. Otherwise, they want to help. People who join, people who become bureaucrats, become bureaucrats because it's a good job. People who, be, who join nonprofits do it because they're passionate. Why wouldn't I want, to, want a nonprofit to help me versus a bureaucrat? Of course I would. But on top of it, what government's good at is putting you in a box and giving you what the box is to give you. So you have X problem, and I'll find a box for you. I'm giving you A, B, and C, but you don't need A, B, and C. Too bad, you're in box X, you get A, B, and C. But you're a nonprofit, I give you what you need. I talk about this in leadership all the time. I talk about leaders, leaders tell me, Larry, I'm a great leader, I treat everyone the same. And I say, no, you're a lazy leader. Equal leadership is lazy leadership. Good leadership is fair leadership. Fair leadership is giving people what they need when they need it to become successful. Some people require more help, some people require less, some people like more, some people like less. In people's lives when they're having successes and failures, they will require more help or less leadership depending upon what they're trying to achieve. That's real leadership. Government should be a facilitator, not an enforcer. Government should lead, not punish. It's a different way of looking at government completely. So I do like the concept of tax breaks, but only if you can first deal with reducing spending. But I can't just take away, and people say, but Larry, it's a welfare state, and I hear that all the time. And here's the reality. And the reality is if you have a child and your child grows up in your household until he or she is 30, you live in your basement, you don't force them to get a job, you do the laundry, you couldn't clean for them, they don't pay rent, wow, that kid should get out of your basement without question. 
But if you throw that kid out of your basement, you're wrong. You encouraged that behavior as a parent for 30 years. You encouraged it if you did that. It's you. You have to wean them off of you. You have to get them to that next level. Government sent it to a lot of people. We have to wean them off. We have to find another answer as we move forward so we can wean them off. I wish there was a fast answer. This isn't. And you might say, but well, Larry, we should just do it, rip the bandit off. I hear that, but here's also a fact of humanity. If you do that, people will be afraid. People who are afraid make bad decisions. That's how it works. They make bad decisions. Remember something. In America, it is very rare the government just takes our rights away. Almost never. We eagerly vote them away. We give them away eagerly because we're afraid. The Patriot Act, NSA, we're afraid. Take our rights, we're afraid. Happens all the time. The terrible SAFE Act after the children were, uh, were shot here in New York, the, the, the SAFE Act. Take our guns away. Take everything away because we're afraid. I don't want to encourage fear. I want to encourage trust. I want to encourage caring. I want to create an environment and a culture, not us versus them, but all of us together. That's not easy. And some people will still say, the hell with you, Larry, no matter what I do. But why wouldn't I at least work with that concept of saying we can trust each other and work together? I want government to be a facilitator, not an enforcer. So I hope that was clear with my idea on tax cuts. All right. Um, uh, anyone was feeling? Uh, ah, yes. Okay. Craig asks, can you address what you'll do about Andrew Cuomo's failed economic development projects? Buffalo, Syracuse Film Hub. Yes, tons of them. Here's the problem, and I'll, I'll be clear about this. I do want business to come to New York. Absolutely. I want to come to New York. I want to come to New York by giving them exactly zero taxpayer dollars. Exactly zero taxpayer dollars. The idea of what Cuomo has done is insane. He has said that New York State should buy property, build something, and then rent it out and be the landlord to a company with you know deep cuts. What happened with that? Person came in, stayed two years, paid cheap rent, the price went up, they left. Now the state owns the property. Well done. Oh my God, could you have been more Soviet Union? Uh, not if you tried. That was very good. I mean, that was a really good Soviet Union job. What a bad idea. How about instead I tell people, please come to New York. Well, Larry, who's going to come? Here's why. When we create something big, people will come. It's like Kennedy. Kennedy saying, we're going to go to the moon. And all of a sudden, everybody wants to go to the moon. I'm going to say, we want to build what I'm calling the one state project. The one state project is the idea that we're going to create something that will connect Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, Albany, New York, out to East Hampton. It is the new Erie Canal, whatever that is. Is that going to be a Google road? Is that going to be a driverless car road? Is that going to be light rail? Is that going to be one of those cool things that Elon Musk is building in California? I don't care what that thing is, but I want that thing. I want it, and I'm going to tell the world that I want it. I'm going to say, come here and build it. I'm going to say it every day. And every company that wants to do it, I'm going to talk about that company every day. What am I going to give them? I'm going to give them tens of millions of dollars of free advertising. My mouth, my yap. I like talking, in case you hadn't heard it before. <laughs> I do. So I'm going to talk a lot about them. That is tens of millions of dollars worth of advertising. And people who want to come, they want to come to Syracuse. They want to come to Rochester. And guess what? When I break down the Board of Regents so that we're not worried about what we're teaching, people will teach what these companies need and the workforce will be there. I won't have to bribe people to stay in my state. They'll want to stay in my state. I want to bribe people to go to college. They'll want to go to college. And now they'll come. So now some will come because the workforce will be there. The local governments will want them to be there. And I will give them tens of millions of dollars in free advertising and not give them one taxpayer dollar. Not one taxpayer dollar. That's what I want to do. That is what's called getting people to want to come to your state, not bribing them to come to your state. Because eventually the dollars go away. The dollars go away, then the company goes away. No, I want the environment to support them to be here. I want the local colleges, SUNY and all of them. I want the technical colleges in Rochester. I want all of them to be actually training people for these companies so they don't want to leave because their workforce is here. If we remove the control, let's take control of the colleges, we can actually have the local businesses help teach in those colleges. They'll be giving, they will be, I don't have to get free college away because the companies will be giving scholarships away because they want their workforce to come work for them. Management, technology, all those things. Those are the projects we have to build. And we build them 
because we talk about it and we want it and people want to come. What does every business want? They want eyeballs. They want people looking at them. They want people talking about them. Well, guess what? I'll do that. I'll do it happily. I'll do it eagerly because the more companies that we bring here, the more smaller companies will come to support those companies. The more companies to support those companies, the more innovation we build. We want to build an entrepreneur spirit in this state. The problem is too many small business, too many small towns have it to where you work for the government, you work for a large company, the one big thing that's in your town, right? Whatever the prison or the school, or you work for a franchise or Walmart, or you're somehow in public assistance and or you sell drugs. There are too many small towns of the country, but in New York State, who so that's their story. That's why they flood into New York City. We can only change that not by bribery, not by punishment, but by culture change. And culture changes at the top. When I'm at the top, I will change the culture. I won't enforce, I will build. Thank you so much for listening, guys. This is Larry Sharp at the Governor's House. Go to Larry Sharp for New York or LarrySharp.com. Support me. If you think what I'm saying makes sense, then don't just talk and check and like. Instead, click on LarrySharp.com and throw me some money. I need it to pay for this, to pay for my staff, to pay for people, to get out there, to travel. You want this to work? You have to pay. I'm paying. I'm here. I'm not working. I'm not with my family. I'm with you. So I'm paying. Pay with me. LarrySharp.com. Give what you can give. I'll talk to you guys two weeks from now. Not next week. We're taking off next week because of the holidays. I'll see you in two weeks. Actually, you know what? Scratch that. I will see you tomorrow. What am I talking about? I'm doing a special show for the holidays tomorrow. Tomorrow, 10 a.m. Eastern. I'll be right here. I'll post it again on Facebook to remind you all. I will see you tomorrow, 10 a.m. LarrySharp.com. Lara Shop for New York. Guys, have a great night. All right.